Alberta's out of control wildfires on this Friday night. We slept in our vehicles. The volatile conditions, the people forced from their homes, and the strangers lending a helping hand. Fresh questions for the Prime Minister about claims of Chinese interference, the conflicting answers, criticism, and lack of clarity. Inching towards the end of the pandemic, the World Health Organization's latest declaration about COVID. And here in London, we are hours away from the King's coronation. The enthusiasm. Don't face the king! A young Ontario man's opportunity of a lifetime. It's out of this world. Plus, Camilla's long journey from mistress to queen. Global National with Donna Friesen. Reporting tonight from London. Good evening and thanks for joining us. On the eve of the first coronation of a British monarch in 70 years, we are here overlooking Westminster Abbey. Their Majesties King Charles and his wife Camilla, the Queen Consort, will both be crowned. And those who can't wait to see it all got a royal surprise today. The King arrived to thank well-wishers who were already lined up outside Buckingham Palace. He spent about 30 minutes shaking hands. He's got very nice soft hands, very nice soft hands. The Prince and Princess of Wales showed up too. Their children will play a role in the coronation and Kate told one person they're excited but a bit nervous. Every family's got the warts and all and we just love them. It's absolutely one of the most unbelievable experiences of my life. It was a busy day. Earlier, the King and Queen Consort hosted a lunch for leaders of the Commonwealth who have arrived for the coronation. And tonight, a more formal reception at Buckingham Palace for world leaders, including the First Ladies of the United States and Ukraine. We're going to come back to the coronation a little later on, but we want to get to a developing story in Alberta tonight. Dozens of wildfires fueled by unusually hot temperatures and high winds are raging. About 13,000 people have been forced from their homes and Alberta needs help. Firefighters from Ontario and Quebec are on their way. It's early May and already more than 80 active wildfires are burning in Alberta. Nearly two dozen are out of control. One of them is in the indigenous community of Fox Lake and more than 3,500 people there have had to flee. Nithu Garcha is in high level Alberta tonight where many evacuees have been sent. Nithu. Yeah, Donna, this sports complex behind me has been converted into an evacuation center where hundreds of people, mostly young families, are staying. And many of the resources inside are donations. And it's far from being the first time High Level has stepped up this way. Forced out by these flames, thousands of residents in the community of Fox Lake now fearing for their future, when they'll return and what they'll return to. The winds picked up and they were 40 kilometer hour plus winds and moved the fire and that's when we started losing homes and stuff. Local officials say the fire has consumed the police station, main general store and multiple homes. Evacuees are in hotels and reception centers in nearby communities like this one in high level. I can't even imagine what they're feeling. And I brought donations for the families, all the communities around here pulled together when one community hurts, say, eh? everyone comes together. Only accessible by barge, it's considered the most isolated community in Little Red River Cree Nation. Several of the more than 3,500 evacuees had never left the community. A lot of them are still on their healing journey and they're still learning to accept and go forward. Local officials say this is the 12th evacuation to high level since 2003, renewing their calls to federal and provincial governments for a dedicated evacuation center. Because we are so far away from the bigger centers, it's harder for us to get the supplies needed. And the service area is so large, like we're a smaller community, but we're servicing the whole area all around us. Crews from High Level and Slave Lake are supporting the effort to protect the community from this out-of-control wildfire. But intense winds have been one of the biggest issues in the fire fight. Now, officials say while the flames came close, the barge to the community is still usable. Little Red River Cree Nation says the evacuation was supported by private boats and some residents had to be airlifted out. But they say some people are still missing and that the chief has spent much of the day inside the community trying to find and get the last few people out. Donna?
All right, Nitu Garcia in high level Alberta. Thank you. There are wildfires in Saskatchewan, too, near the Musiman and Salto First Nations. Fires have burned across at least 3,900 hectares of land. Another fire has led to evacuation orders for hundreds of people in the Clearwater River, Dene Nation, and La Loche. There are 14 active wildfires in Saskatchewan right now. B.C. has more than 50 wildfires right now, plus flooding and mudslides in some areas, leading to evacuation orders and highway closures. And more heavy rain is falling in the flood zones. There's still a state of emergency in Cache Creek where a house has been destroyed and people in 21 other homes have been told to leave. Flood watches and warnings are in place across B.C.'s southern and central interior and people are doing what they can to try to hold back the water. Calls are growing for the federal government to take action over reports a Chinese diplomat in Toronto was involved in an alleged plot to intimidate Conservative MP Michael Chong and his family. Today, the Chinese government called those allegations a political stunt and raised its concerns with Canada's ambassador to China about reports Canada could expel the diplomat involved. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau continues to insist he did not know about the threats until this week. Mackenzie Gray reports. Hello. Hey, good to see you. He tried to focus on the Liberal convention, but the Prime Minister was dogged again by Chinese interference. That information never made it up to the political level in my office, uh, to me, uh, or even to the Minister of, of uh, Public Safety at the time. Justin Trudeau referencing a 2021 CSIS report outlining threats from the Chinese government against Conservative MP Michael Chong and his family. Information Trudeau previously said he first learned about when it was reported in the Globe and Mail. Was it ever briefed up out of CSIS? It was not. CSIS made the determination that it wasn't something that needed to be raised to a higher level. Because but that explanation wasn't true. The Prime Minister's National Security Advisor contradicted him yesterday, telling Chong CSIS did share the report with the Privy Council. Trudeau wouldn't say who gave him the bad info. I shared the best information I had at the time on Wednesday, both to Mr. Chong uh, and to Canadians. But it turns out that information was incorrect. So who told you the report never left CSIS? Okay. Um, I get uh, briefings regularly from uh, various sources. I'm not going to go into details uh, on that. And it's not even clear who in the Privy Council office received the report. The Prime Minister had three national security advisors in 2021, but only Vincent Rigby responded to questions from Global News, saying he left the job before the briefing was written. Neither David Morrison nor Mike McDonald, both of whom are currently high-level civil servants, responded to our questions. It's clear that the government doesn't treat these threats seriously. In an interview airing Sunday on the West Block, Michael Chong says the Prime Minister didn't want to know about the report. He's been Prime Minister for almost eight years. Mm -hmm. I think this might be excusable eight months into a new government, but there's no excuse for this eight years in. The opposition has called for the expulsion of the Chinese diplomat involved in the Chong story, but the Prime Minister wouldn't commit to that, Donna, saying he's weighing the potential impacts of kicking him out. All right, Mackenzie Gray in Ottawa, thanks. Well, now back to the coronation here in London. Excitement is building. Crystal Gamansing is with me. Crystal, so many people have a real connection to the king, and you met one Canadian who's really excited to be here. He absolutely is. His name is Jay Patel, and he's a part of a group of youth ambassadors for the Prince's Trust. And in just a few hours, he will watch history unfold up close. As people flock to the Mall at times, battling the elements, longing to be a part of history, one young Canadian holds a golden ticket. It's, it's out of this world. Despite being in London, Jay Patel doesn't entirely believe he's the Canadian Youth Ambassador for the Prince's Trust and will be attending the coronation. They told me that you'll be like one of the 2,000 who will be inside the Westminster Abbey and I'm like, one of the 2,000. That, now, that sounds really cool. Patel turned to the Prince's Trust in 2021 after moving to Canada to attend school. He was alone yeah. in a strange country seized by a pandemic and needing a job. Today, he works as a cook at the CN Tower. His Majesty, like, it's his charity who helped me out, so I'm always grateful and thankful to him that he, he's doing this charity work. The Prince's Trust operates in 20 countries, offering young people free courses to build employment skills. The charity goes back to 1976, when then Prince Charles used his naval severance pay to fund the initiative. 
If you look at the polls, the king isn't very popular with the younger generation, but he does have a long history of supporting youth. Patel is clearly a fan, and his family back in India is proud of all of his hard work. Although he says his dad did ask if he's sure his invite to the king and queen concert's coronation is real. It's been like a, a hard journey, but it has, it's not an end, but I got like a beautiful moment right now that I'm gonna enjoy. And someday it will be like a really successful story for me. Patel says he isn't sure how he will respond on the day, but Donna, he has prepared a bit of a pep talk for himself. He said he was going to tell himself to be cool and just breathe. All right. I love how his dad thought he had a fake ticket. <laughs> Crystal Gamancing, thanks. You're welcome. A war of words in the battle for back moods. Coming up, why a Russian mercenary leader is threatening to pull out his troops. This is a giant replica of St. Edward's crown, the one Charles will be crowned with. This one weighs 300 kilograms and is nearly five meters tall. We're back from London in a moment. It was with us for so long it felt like it would never end. Well, today the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 is no longer a global health emergency, though it does warn the virus remains a public health threat. The worst thing any country could do now is to use this news as a reason to let down its guard, to dismantle the systems it has built, or to send the message to its people that COVID-19 is nothing to worry about. It's not possible to know exact numbers because few people are testing anymore, but the WHO estimates there have been more than 765 million confirmed cases of COVID-19 around the world and that nearly 7 million people have died from it. In Canada, there have been over 52,000 deaths. In Ukraine, the leader of Russia's Wagner paramilitary group is threatening to pull his troops from Bakhmut because of ammunition shortages, and he posted a graphic and expletive-laden video criticizing the Russian defense minister. Standing in a field of bodies of dead fighters, Yevgeny Prigozhin said tens of thousands have been killed. He blamed Russia's defense ministry, claiming ammunition supplies have been cut. Prigozhin says Wagner will leave Bakhmut by May 10th. The unit's forces are key to Russia's offensive in the region. Serbia has been shaken by another mass shooting. Eight people were killed, 14 others wounded when a gunman went on a shooting rampage in two villages south of the capital. The suspect wearing a t-shirt with a neo-Nazi slogan has been arrested. Serbia's president called it a terrorist attack and he introduced gun, tough new gun control measures. The country is still reeling after a 13-year-old boy shot and killed eight students and a security guard at a school on Wednesday. Triumphant image transformation ahead, Camilla's path to becoming queen. This is Buckingham Palace, where King Charles was born 74 years ago. We're back from London in a moment. The woman at King Charles' side for the coronation is Camilla Parker Bowles, his longtime love. Her public image has undergone quite a transformation. The two had a decades-long affair while they were both married to other people, and to some, that made Camilla a villain. Fast forward a few decades, and she's queen. Long before the fairy tale wedding of Charles and Diana in 1981, there was Charles and Camilla. They first met in 1970. Their bond never broke, even when they were married to other people. Monarchy and monogamy rarely go hand in hand. I think that probably... Uh, Camilla has completed uh, her her journey from from being you know one of the most vilified women in this country to being not one of the most popular but being amongst a, a certain lot of people very popular indeed. That journey from mistress to queen has been agonizing. In the early 90s, when Charles and Diana's marriage was faltering, his decades-long affair was revealed in a recording of an intercepted, explicit bedtime phone call with Camilla. The tabloids dubbed it Camilla Gate. I'm sure they were hideously embarrassed. But I think when people are in love, um, they say all silly sorts of silly things to each other. 
um, and, but it's nobody's business. I feel that the readers are big enough, adult enough and deserve to know the facts. So we publish the transcript and they can make their own minds up. For Charles, it was humiliating proof of his affair and brought into question his suitability as heir. For Camilla, it made her an outcast. The Queen wouldn't go anywhere where she knew she was. And um, Prince Philip was absolutely not interested in her. Charles never seemed to cut ties with Camilla. And that first interview he and Diana did after their engagement was telling. I'm amazed that she's uh, been brave enough to take me on. <laughs> and I suppose in love. Of course. <laughs> Whatever in love means. <laughs> Diana later said she felt traumatized after the interview. And that was just the beginning. The wedding went ahead, and there among the guests was Camilla. She even befriended Diana in the early days of the marriage, before Diana famously said in an interview, there were three of us in the marriage, so it was a bit crowded. In his book, Prince Harry says he and his brother William urged their father not to marry Camilla, that he feared she'd be a wicked stepmother, and that she was a villain and dangerous because, he claims, she leaked stories to the press to bolster her image. I think she's brave because she manages somehow to cope with people saying awful things about her, whether it was Diana saying she was a rock viler, whether it's Prince Harry saying she's a villain. After Diana's tragic death, Camilla did keep a low profile until this moment in 1999. It was their first public appearance as a couple. Photographers tipped off in advance, used so many flashes, the British Epilepsy Association urged broadcasters to stop airing it. They made every front page, slowly winning over the tabloid press that had almost destroyed Camilla. It took longer to win over the Queen. After a private ceremony. In 2005, when they were married, Charles's boys were there, but not his mother, though she did host the reception. An enormous campaign a PR campaign has been launched to, to rehabilitate her and to make her acceptable to the public, and it's been very effective. Six months before she died, the Queen said it was her special wish that Camilla become Queen Consort, and Camilla has quietly carried on. She's patron to many charities with a special interest in domestic violence. She worked very hard, plus, and it's a very big plus, she um, had made Charles extremely happy, very relaxed. They have so much in common. You know, they loved, they had the same sense of humour. They would roar with laughter at the same thing. Their perfectly imperfect love affair enduring it all, now as king and queen. Next, royal biographer Robert Hardman on what to expect at the coronation tomorrow. Welcome back to London. No one outside the royal family can truly understand what it means to be a monarch. Royal biographers get a closer glimpse than the rest of us. And earlier I spoke with Robert Hardman. He's a journalist and author of Queen of Our Times, who's now working on a book about King Charles. You know, King Charles has prepared his whole life for this role, of course. Do you think that makes it easier or more difficult for him to own it? I think it makes it easier. I mean, he didn't really like discussing it when his mother was alive, so it left to the rest of us speculating. What sort of a king is he going to be, we all asked. And we never got an answer because he felt it was wrong to talk about these things while his mother was queen. He is a traditionalist, and yet we've been told that this coronation ceremony will be different, will be more modern. What are you expecting to see? I'm expecting to see some very ancient touches. I mean, the, 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 the idea of anointing goes back to the Old Testament. Of course, some people will say, well, how can a crowns and scepters and fairy tale carriages have any place in a 21st century society? But um, it does, because if you want a monarchy, that's what, what it comes with. When you look back to 1953, it was largely elderly war heroes and aristocrats, um, very much white, very male. That was, that was uh, the establishment of 53. This is going to see a huge cross-section, not just of British life, but of Commonwealth life, you know, very prominent Canadian elements to it. Uh, it, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to feel younger. But we won't see the anointing, I understand. We still, there will absolutely be a screen. Right. Yeah. We, what we yeah. will see, we didn't see last time, we saw most of it last time, but we didn't see the anointing and we didn't see Holy Communion. The Queen thought that was a very personal, private moment. This time, 
Um, we will see both uh, the king and queen take communion, and we will also see the, the, the queen being anointed. And the, the anointing, it's a sort of, it's a dab. Well, I mean, the queen sort of, is being anointed as well. She, she is being ah, anointed. It's a, 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 a sort of a lesser anointing compared to the king. <laughs> right. He gets hands, chest, and uh, head. Uh, in her case, it's, it's a sort of dab on, on, on the head. Ah. Uh, but she will still be anointed, and that will be seen on, on, on camera. You, you know, for many people, Queen Elizabeth was the monarchy. Yeah. Can Charles fill her shoes? Well, it's, of course, it's an incredibly tough act to follow. I mean, we know he's passionate about the environment. We know he's passionate about um, architecture, these sort of things, because he's spoken out about it in a way that the Queen didn't do. And he obviously has to um, be more careful about how he pronounces things now. But he's not going to stop taking an active interest in in things like the environment. He's just going to have to do it a different way. There is a more vocal Republican movement mm -hmm. in this country now than there has been in the past. Mm. Do you have a sense of what it will be like on Saturday? How many people will turn up? How interested I, people I, will I, be? I think, well, obviously, people who protest are more vocal than people who are content. I was in Liverpool the other day, and there was a protest there, and they were very much a sort of small part of the crowd. But nonetheless, uh, you know, they, 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 they chant. Um, and, and, uh, not and, my king, right? Not my king, that's what yeah. they're chanting. They've got that their slogan and they, they've sort of, they, they, they're certainly more active now than, than, than was ever the case under, under the Queen's reign. Because I think they you know, see this as their, their chance, their opportunity. You, you, can't, you can't sort of approach it like a sort of a, a, a talent show or an election. You can't go sort of touting for votes or support. You've just got to, you've got to do what your role is and hope that people appreciate that, that it bring some benefit. Of course it's irrational. I mean, if you were starting a new country tomorrow, you simply wouldn't suddenly say, I know, we, we must put one family in charge and, and put their faces on the coins and banknotes and, uh, and give and, them all these and, jewels. Yeah, and just sort yes. of leave them there and keep yeah. them there in perpetuity. I mean, you, you wouldn't, um, but, but it's a system. I mean, there are so many things in life that aren't rational, but, you know, we, we're very fond of them. Try banning Christmas. And that is Global National for this Friday. I'm Donna Friesen. Tomorrow is the big day. Our live coverage of the coronation starts at 5 a.m. Eastern, 2 a.m. Pacific. I'll be right here overlooking Westminster, praying it doesn't rain. You can watch it on Global and on all our streaming platforms. It starts early, so get your hot cup of tea ready. For now, bye-bye from London.